security is the, the topic for this afternoon. Security is really important, and it's really complicated. The amount of knowledge we now have about security is way too big. It's beyond the ability of developers to keep track of stuff. And so as a consequence, we have specialists to do that for us, but that is itself problematic. So sometimes security is thought of as a war between guys with different colored hats. So you got the guys in the white hats who are supposed to be good guys fighting against guys in black hats who are probably bad guys, except none of them actually wear hats. You know, so it's a system based on invisible hats. And so those guys are off, and they're all contending with, with security. And the idea is or we have this deep specialization now where they do all the security, and everybody else just does work. And that turns out not to work. I, I have a problem with that for a couple of reasons. One is I don't trust any of the guys in the hats. Um, some famous white hats were formerly black hats, and there are black hats who were formerly white hats, and there are gray hats and maybe taupe hats and other guys in between. I just don't trust that model. But even worse is the specialization, the idea that um, we can all do our part, and they will worry about the security, and everything will work out fine. And in fact, that doesn't work at all. So um, I contend that security is everybody's job. Everybody has to be doing security. It's not something we can delegate to specialists. But because there is so much information about security and it changes and develops so fast, it's impossible for you to keep up with that. So what I'm going to do today instead is to give you some principles. And understanding those principles, you will be able to make good decisions on your own about security. In fact, very often better decisions than maybe someone in an invisible hat might make. And so every once in a while, something's going to drop down like that, and that'll be a principle. And there'll be a number of those we'll go through. We'll also be looking at some sources of insecurity. And those will be highlighted in a red box. And the number one thing is that things change. It might be that there's some special case at the time you deploy something which says security is not a concern here because of these special factors which limit vulnerability or whatever, and so it's not going to be a problem. But then things change, and that system which was formerly OK is now suddenly um, a vulnerability. So um, it is not unusual for the purpose or use or scope of software to change over its life. Rarely are the security properties of software systems re-examined in the context of new or evolving missions, and this leads to insecure systems. The person who said this was me. Um, th this is my contribution to, um, to uh, hatness. Um, so uh, the second principle is don't nobody do nothing stupid and nobody gets hurt. This is a, a general principle of security. We don't ever want to be doing anything stupid, ever, for any reason. Uh, sometimes we're compelled to, but we should try to resist that as much as possible. Just being smart turns out to be sort of a prerequisite to being secure. So that's a good place to start. Um, so we're going to be talking about principles. Uh, no tricks, no hacks. Anybody who tells you he's got a trick for solving your security problems, hang up, walk away. This is not someone you want to be getting advice from. So um, another principle, deterrence is not effective. Some of our intuitions for how we secure things in the real world do not work in the online world. Um, you can't punish an invisible attacker, um, particularly one who's amplified by botnets who is physically completely decoupled from the attack. So, you, um, so deterrence is not effective. Prevention is the only thing which is effective. So that's what we're going to focus on. I'm going to start with this guy. This is Johann Martin Schleyer. He is or was a, um, a German priest living in Bavaria. And one day in about 1879, God came to him in a dream and told him to do something remarkable. So to understand the significance of what God told him, we have to go back a little bit. So long, long ago on the plain of Shinar, the best architects, Planners, managers, builders, material specialists, engineers, all got together to build the tallest tower in the world. And their goal was to reach heaven with their tower, the famous Tower of Babel. 
God, for some reason, and the scripture is not clear exactly why, did not like this. And so he came down to earth and he confused their languages. He confounded their languages so that suddenly they were all speaking different languages. And basically he created the I-18N problem. And they all then wandered off and set up their own kingdoms where they could talk to each other and not anybody else. And they warred against each other for the next thousands of years. So um, one night, God comes back to Schleyer and says, I changed my mind about that. And so what I want you to do is to create the universal language, the world's language, the language which will allow all the people in the world to talk. So um, he accepted this mission from God and set to work on designing a new language. And that language he called Volapük, uh, meaning world speech in Volapük. Uh, and he published a book in German about his new language in 1880. Now, it turns out lots of people had done work on artificial languages before. If you're a fan of Neil Stevenson and you read the Baroque cycle, you may remember John Wilkins, who um, developed a language that he called a real character. He was a real guy, and he actually designed an artificial language. Uh, George Delgarno, also in England about the same time, was working on a competing design. Neither of them found any acceptance. And there were lots of others after that but at this particular time in Europe, people were finally receptive to it. Um, maybe it's because Europe had been at war for so long, almost constantly, and people were tired of it. And they were seeing an increasing level of militarism and were concerned that things are about to get really bad. And they were tired of their national government sending them off to die periodically. And maybe if they could all get on the same page with the same language, they could take over and make the world a better place. So um, Volapük starts off the hockey stick. It kind of goes slow for a couple of years, and then about um, 1885, it starts to grow. And it's almost like an internet phenomenon. Suddenly, Volapük is happening everywhere. There are hundreds of Volapük societies all over the world. Um, every other day, there's a book published about or in Volapük. Every month, a new journal appears written in Volapük. It's taking off. And um, not just among you know, the, the academics or the elites. Working class people are in it too. Uh, you know, it's becoming a movement, and it's starting to look like it's going to uh, change the world. Um, and you know, so the hope of finally de that we're going to get to undo that thing that happened on Shinar and all be able to speak and communicate effectively could change the world. So there's a huge amount of optimism around it. And much of the success that the Volapük movement experienced was because of this guy, Augusta Kirchhoffs, who is a uh, Dutch linguist. Um, he got into this thing about 85 and you know, was transformed by it. He, started, uh, he wrote several books in it. He lectured extensively, traveled all over Europe, convincing everybody that Volapük is something that they wanted to get involved in. Very successful. Um, as a result of his activity, in the second Volapük conference, he was appointed the director of the Volapük Institute. And he was going to be responsible for um, maintaining the grammar and, and the details of the language and publicizing them throughout the world. At the, uh, the next year, at the third Congress, they decided to hold the entire Congress in Volapük. So everybody was speaking Volapük, including the waiters. Um, everybody was in the language. Um, huge activity. Um, uh, Kirchhoffs recommends that uh, recommends some simplifications to the language. He's been trying to teach people, and found that there were some places with just seemed arbitrarily complicated that could be very easily remedied. And so he proposed a simplified grammar in order to make the language easier to adopt. Uh, Schleyer said that God told me to make this language, and so I should have total veto over anything you guys come up with, because this is mine. Um, and he was supported by the German delegation. Um, the, the other delegations mostly went with Kirchhoffs. Uh, it got really ugly, and then they forked. And at that point, a bunch of people said, well, as long as we're proposing changes, 
And all these cunning linguists started throwing features into the thing, sometimes new languages. Hey, let's go with um, this language instead. I made up that one. And the whole thing fell apart. Within a year, the movement was stone cold dead. And that, that's why you've never heard of it. So instead of debabilization, they ended up with rebabilization. They actually ended up with more languages that they couldn't understand each other with than before they started. Is there a, uh, a lesson here about standardization? Yeah, maybe, maybe there is. Um, now, since then, a lot of other people have gone on and continue to design languages. It's actually an interesting hobby. So the novelist who invented The Saint, that was a, a TV show for a while, uh, he invented a language called um, Paleo Neo. Uh, the guy who invented the board game Careers, he invented a language. J.R.R. Tolkien um, was a rabid language designer. He called it a secret vice. He designed many, many languages for mythical races, um, and then started writing poetry in those languages and, and epic stories in those languages, and then wrote a novel that incorporated all of that stuff as the backstory. Um, so the most popular artificial language today is Klingon. It's true. So anyway, I, I went through all of that because I wanted to introduce you to Kirchhoff's, because he's an amazing guy. So before he got sucked into the Volapük thing, he wrote a book on military cryptography. It was the first modern book on military cryptography. Prior to Kirchhoff's, cryptography was secret messages put on paper, delivered through couriers. But that changes with the telegraph. But before, until Kirchhoff's, nobody understands what the implications of that are. So Kirchhoff's reinvents everything based on electronic communication. And uh, in his book, he describes a number of principles which are still held to be true. It was an amazingly foresighted piece of work. Um, and perhaps the most important of his principles was this one. The design of a system should not require secrecy, and compromise of the system should not inconvenience the correspondence. It's, this is something that's called the Kirchhoff's principle. It's um, uh, not intuitive. In fact, I still see papers every once in a while by some idiot academic who hasn't read this guy or, or heard of him who's suggesting that we should take as much of our systems and try to keep it uh, secret in order to frustrate the bad guys. And it turns out that just doesn't work. Um, so um, Kirchhoff recommends instead that um, you, you publish all the stuff. And in fact, some people go even further and say, we will actively publish, we will deliver the details of our system to the attackers um, in order to, to make us certain that we're trusting nothing except the secrecy of our keys, that all other aspects of the system should be open. Um, so security is not cryptography, but some of the things that cryptographers worry about are important things for people who are concerned with security to worry about as well. So here we have Alice and Bob and they want to exchange messages securely. So they'll set up a cryptographic system. And it may look like something like this. So Alice will take her message, which is sometimes called the plain text, and she'll put it into an encryption machine. And she will also put into that encryption machine the key. And the key should be the only piece of secret material in the system. Um, the machine will then produce a ciphertext. She can transmit the ciphertext to Bob once he has it, he will put it into his machine and probably the same key, which they exchanged in a previous meeting, and he can then recover the plain text. And anybody who could intercept the message, if they don't also have the key, will be unable to figure out what Alice and Bob are talking about. And, and that's a good thing. Um, so the Kirchhoff principle says there's no security in obscurity. We don't want to have things which are possible to discover. Um, in fact, the more things we keep secret, the harder it is to keep all the secrets. So um, figure out what's critical to have kept secret, and that's all. Um, now, it turns out there is an encryption scheme which is provably perfect, that no amount of computation or time can possibly recover the message. That's an amazing thing. Um, and it's called the one-time pad, and it is truly, provably unbreakable. 
Um, but it comes with some rules, and it is only unbreakable if you follow those rules. And I'll, I will show you how to break it. In fact, you will break it uh, when I break the rules. You're going to do some crypt analysis here. So these are the rules. The key must always remain secret. I mean, that's obvious. If the key is ever revealed, then the messages are revealed. The key must be at least as long as the plain text. This is an unusual property of this technique. Most other uh, cryptographic systems have much shorter keys, generally a fixed length key, just to make the key management easier. Because the one-time key, key management is so difficult, it is rarely used, but um, it is the safest. Um, and the ciphertext is obtained by exclusive oaring the plain text with the key. So mechanically, this is one of the simplest possible encryption algorithms. So um, this is a plain text. Okay, this is the JSON logo. Um, normally, you think of plain texts as being text, you know, sequen sequences of, of letters and words. But you know, any data can be encrypted, and it turns out. Uh, doing this graphically will be easier for you to be doing the code breaking. So this is my key. This is just random stuff. You know, I, I, I wrote a random number generator and I was careful about how I generated the thing. And this is cryptographically random. If I would then exclusive or those two together, I get that. And if I did my job right, you cannot see any part of the original thing. It's completely hidden in the apparent noise in the key. So um, that's encrypted. Um, so there's one other rule, and that is that the key must be perfectly random. And randomness is a hard thing to determine. And in fact, uh, we are really bad at, at, at identifying randomness. You know, If I were to ask you to pick a random number, most of you are likely to pick the same number. So uh, we're, we're just not good at that. Um, so this is a weak key. I generated this one with Photoshop. I just took um, a noise filter in Photoshop and made something. And it looks exactly like the other key, right? But it's not. Um, so when I exclusive or it together, um, you can see signals leaking through now. So a cryptanalyst looks at this and goes, oh, God, you know, the code is broken. You, know, you can see substantial parts of the message. And knowing this much, you can then go and mechanically figure out the rest of it. So the key has to be uh, truly random. Um, there's one other rule, and that is the key must never be used more than once. And that's why the algorithm is called the one-time pad. The idea is that you've got a, a pad with your keys on them. You'll tear it off, use it once, and destroy it so that you're never even accidentally going to use it a second time. And that's the thing that makes key management so difficult with this, because you're constantly having to generate new keys. And you can't send them over the wire using this technique, because it requires as much key as the data you're going to send. So you just you can't get there from here. Um, so let me show you another example. Okay, This is a picture of me uh, in Istanbul. Um, and You'll, re you'll recognize this as being the key that we used the first time, right? And I'll exclusive um, or them together, and I get that. Now, if I take this and exclusive or it with the previous message that we derived, we get this. Because the two keys cancel out, because they're the same thing under exclusive or, so you get the two messages exclusive or, there is no security in exclusive oring together two messages. And so both messages are revealed. And your brain has this remarkable ability to find signals in noise. And so you're, you're breaking codes right now. It's, it's amazing. So um, cryptography is not security. But there are things that cryptography can teach us about security. Uh, one thing you've got to watch out for is I've, I've seen lots of cases where someone's got a system and, oops, it's not secure. What are we going to do? And someone will say, let's encrypt something. The idea is that you know, we can insert security into this system by finding something that we can make look more random. And that almost never works. Um, so you, you don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that cryptography is security. But cryptography can teach us things. For example, one, in, in the scenarios that um, cryptographers think about, um, they look at the roles of the attackers. And there's not just one attacker. There are many attackers. And they all pursue different strategies to different ends. 
and you want to be secure against all of them. For example, there's Eve. Eve is an eavesdropper, okay? And she will watch the messages flowing between Alice and Bob and try to determine things. If it's pos possible for her to decrypt or to intercept keys, she will do that. She might just do traffic analysis. You know, the, the fact that Alice and Bob are talking may be significant, even if she can't determine specifically what they're saying. Uh, there's another character called Mallory who um, has more tools available. Um, she'll, um, she's capable of doing man-in-the-middle attacks. So she can uh, uh, impersonate Alice and Bob. So Alice will try to connect to Bob, but she'll actually connect to, to Mallory. So she'll say, I want to connect. And Mallory will say to Bob, I want to connect. And Bob will say, what's your password? And Mallory will say, what's your password? And here's my password. Here's my password. So, OK, you're logged in. She said, sorry, you couldn't connect. Change your password, purge my account, you know, all that stuff. Um, so you want to be secure against that. In my own practice, I've added one other character. Now, I don't see this guy in the literature, but I think he should be there, and that's Satan. So we have some guy who is totally malevolent, who is extremely powerful, has enormous resources. Um, he's got all the power of the NSA and those aliens who built the pyramids and everything else. He's got computational complexity. He's got all the backdoors to all the algorithms. He can do all the worst possible stuff. Um, so how do you keep him out of your system? What some people do is say, well, let's turn it into an identity problem. So if we can determine that that's Satan, we won't let him connect. That's called a blacklist. And it turns out that doesn't work because he can easily create a new identity and go ahead. So uh, then you try the opposite technique, which is we will identify everybody in the world. And if anybody tries to connect who isn't one of those, then we know it's him and we won't let him in. Um, that's called a whitelist, and that doesn't work either. Um, so what do you do? Uh, my approach is I want him to be able to connect because he actually might be a customer and he might have some good reason to want to get onto our system. If I can let him onto our system and he cannot damage us, and if he cannot damage any of our other customers, if all he can do is the normal things that our system is designed to do, I've done my job, okay? So uh, Satan, as one of the characters in, in the scenario, is critically important. He's the most important guy we want to work with because he's actually our customer. We don't want to be frustrating our customers even if they're malevolent. We want to make everything work right and nobody gets hurt. Um, so security needs to be factored into every decision. It turns out every decision we make has security implications. And most of what we do as programmers is make decisions. We're making thousands of decisions every day. Um, and we always need to be aware of security. One of the biggest sources of insecurity is we'll go back and make it secure later. There's a tendency among developers to think, you know, the hard part is getting the system up or getting the machines to talk or getting the pixels on the screen. You know, once we did the hard work, you know, then we'll turn it over to the hats and, and they'll, they'll add the security and, and we're done. It turns out that doesn't work. Um, you can't go back and add security. You need to be concerned with security from the very beginning. Um, so you can't add security just as you can't add reliability. Um, insecurity and unreliability must be removed. You know, so it's a subtractive thing. It's not an additive thing. You can't add a security box to a system you have to remove all the sources of insecurity from the system instead. Um, having su survived to this point is not guarantee of future survival. So uh, we're constantly under threat. So far, none of the threats have put us out of business. That doesn't mean the threats aren't coming. So we need to be vigilant always. Um, the impossible is not possible. So if you're, um, if your security solution requires solution to insolvable problems, it's not going to work. So you don't want to be doing that. Um, and you also need to be aware of the corollary. If a measure is not effective, it is ineffective. So you only want to be pursuing strategies that can actually work. Uh, you don't want to prevent, or you don't want to prohibit what you can't prevent because you can't, so you don't want to do that. 
but also anything you don't prevent, you allow. False security is worse than no security um, because um, you will make bad decisions. If you're aware that you have no security or your security is compromised, you will be cautious. Um, if, if you're practicing under false security, you will be reckless and you're more likely to amplify the amount of harm that is uh, possible. Um, so uh, I'm going to shift now to the, the browser platform. Um, that's where most of what we do is happening now. Um, the browser is horribly insecure. Uh, we are still fixing it later after a couple of decades with this crap. Uh, HTML5 made it worse instead of better, and I'll get to why that is in a bit. Yet it is better than everything else. Uh, there are fundamental mistakes that have been made in virtually every other application delivery system, including systems developed after the web, that cause them to be less reliable, uh, less safe than the web itself, despite the web's inherent problems. Uh, one of the things we saw in, in Java and, and other systems was a blame the victim security model, where whenever the system is faced with a decision about whether to allow something or not that it is incompetent to, to determine, it'll push it to the user. And usually ask the user in language that the user cannot possibly understand and cannot possibly make a correct decision. And those architects think they've done their job. Um, so anything that goes wrong, it's the user's fault. It's not their fault, which is, I think, quite irresponsible. Um, so whose interest does a program represent? This is the thing that the web got fundamentally right that every other platform has got wrong. Generally, um, most systems interpret the role of a program as representing the interest of the user. The web uniquely decided that, no, the, the interest of a program is the website that sent us the program, which does not necessarily represent the user. That is the fundamental thing that the web got right. Um, and, and that's why so much commerce has moved to the web away from all the other things that got it wrong. Um, but, you know, the web didn't get everything right. So the thing the web didn't recognize was that there can be more interests involved than the user and the site. Um, so if a malicious party can exploit coding conventions, they can inject malicious code, and that code gets all of the rights of the site. This is known as the XSS problem. Uh, so what, uh, what can an attacker do if he can get some code onto your page? You should know this, but it's good to review. Um, the attacker can request additional scripts from any server in the world. And once it gets a foothold, it can obtain all the script it wants. So it only needs to be able to insert that much script. It can then load megabytes of script to continue the, the attack. The browser has the same origin policy, which limits the ability of a of a web page to communicate with other sites. It does not in any way restrict the ability of an evil site to inject additional script into your page. The attacker can read the document. The attacker can see everything the user can see and also things the user can't see. So hidden fields, cookies, um, encoding comments, all the stuff that might have been delivered, it sees all of that. Uh, the attacker can make requests of your server, and your server cannot detect that the request did not originate with your application. So if you're using SSL, and you should, the attacker gets your secure connection to your server. If your server accepts SQL queries, then the attacker gets direct access to your database. If you are generating SSL queries by concatenating information that came from the browser, then you only probably gave the attacker control of your database. And this is because SSL was optimized for SSL injection attacks. Um, the attacker has control over the display and can request additional information from your server, or from the user. And the user cannot detect that the request did not originate with your application. So um, most of the browsers now have anti-phishing Chrome, which is intended to help users identify when the page came from a legitimate source or when it didn't. 
Unfortunately, most users completely ignore that, so it's not useful at all. But if the user is paying attention to it, then it will say, this is legit, because the HTML came from a trusted source, and it completely ignores where the script came from. So if the script is evil, the, the, the browser says it's good. Um, so one defense some systems have against this is any time the user tries to do something that's important, um, ask for their password, because that's something that it can't get. Except that it has complete control over the screen, right? So it can just ask the user, oh, by the way, again, what's your password? Now, a lot of systems will routinely and unexpectedly ask the user for password, sometimes at, at unlikely times. What you're actually doing is training your users to reveal their passwords the second the attacker gets control. Uh, the attacker can then take all of the information that obtained from the, from the document, from dialoguing with the user, from querying your database, and send it to any server in the world. Again, the same origin policy limits the ability of the browser to read data from other sites, but puts no limitation on the ability to send data to the evilest server in the world. Uh, the browser does not prevent any of these things. Web standards require these weaknesses. If you were to build a browser which does not expose your users to all of these problems, it is not standards compliant. That is the state of web standards. Uh, now, there are bugs, but, and, and bugs in the browsers will certainly compromise your security. These are not bugs. This is standard behavior. The consequences of an attack can be horrible. There can be real harm to customers. There can be loss of trust. There can be legal liabilities. There's even talk of criminal liabilities uh, for um, incompetently managed websites. And given how hard it is to, to manage these competently, that's a risk. So this thing is called uh, XSS, cross-site scripting. It's not called CSS because that's a different abomination that we'll talk about another day. They didn't want to have confusion with that. But this term is itself really confused because it turns out that um, cross-site scripting is not a requirement for this attack, that you can have the whole attack happening within a site. Uh, so the cross-site thing is not significant. And it also turns out cross-site scripting is extremely desirable. When it's done right, we call that a mashup. And that is something we want to do. We want to be able to have script from a merchant and script from a payment system and script from an advertiser all on the same page, all working together cooperatively for the benefit of the user. That's a good thing. Um, you know, so the idiot security guys who came up with, this, with these initials got it wrong. But part of the nature of the way we practice security is once it's, the security community has gotten it wrong, everybody else has to follow. And so developers have to work with this terminology, even though it doesn't make sense. This is the wrong thing to call this. So cross-site scripting attacks were invented in 1995. They became possible when JavaScript and, and frames were added to Netscape 2. And we've made very little progress on, on fixing this since then. So we're almost 20 years in, into this problem now. Uh, we are finally making some baby steps. So there's the content security policy, which is now in a draft, um, which will potentially limit where script can occur in a page and, and where it can be loaded from the net. Um, it's certainly a step in the right direction, but it's not a big enough step. It's completely useless if, if you are still doing any of the bad practices in script insertion if you're still using inline uh, event handlers or JavaScript URLs or even in-page script, anything you allow yourself to do, the attacker can do too. And so this mechanism is useless to protect you if you're doing any of those things or other things. Um, there's also the, uh, I, the, the sandboxed iframe, uh, which is also in a candidate release now. I first I proposed this at the Open Ajax Alliance meeting in Manhattan at IBM's office in 2006. And it's such an obviously good idea. I'm sure other people had proposed it earlier, and I'm sure a lot of other smarter people proposed it later. So it's sort of gratifying that 
it's finally gotten into a recommendation or a candidate. This should not have taken that long. It's not that hard. And again, it's not a complete solution. So the problem with both of these is they're both unsafe by default. So you have to change your practices in an incompatible way in order to take advantage of these things. Um, at the same time, HTML5 added powerful new capabilities like local storage and local database and stuff like that, giving the attacker full access to that stuff. So anything that you put in there the attacker gets access to um, read and write. So he can go and modify that stuff, cause even greater confusion, which can trip you up in other ways. I think that uh, W3C was negligent in pushing that stuff before attending to security. So that stuff is in browsers now. This stuff isn't yet. This is in previews, and in a few years will be out there. But until it's everywhere, it's useless to you. Um, so I talked about mashups. It turns out a mashup is a self-inflicted cross-site scripting attack. It's when you're intentionally putting code from multiple parties into the same browser instance. None of those are able to defend themselves against each other. So if any of them are malicious, then you've given away the farm. It turns out advertising is a mashup. It, advertising is code coming from a third party. And it may surprisingly or unsurprisingly have JavaScript in it, and that JavaScript can do all of the things that we were just talking about. It turns out the most reliable, cost-effective method of injecting evil code into a page is to buy an ad. And none of the new things that are in the W3C proposals deal with that. And that's kind of a problem, because the whole web is pretty much driven on advertising. So that's, we, that's a model we can't easily walk away from. So why is there XSS? How did this happen? Uh, there are a number of factors. One is that the web stack is way too complicated. There are too many languages, each with its own encoding, quoting, commenting, and escapement conventions that can all be nested inside of each other. Uh, in, in previous talks, I've described it as a turducken. You know, a turducken is where you've got a stuffed chicken inside of a stuffed duck inside of a stuffed turkey. Um, it gets really complicated. So if you're looking at a piece of code, and trying to understand, is this thing malicious or not, it's really hard because you have to undo several layers of wrapping in order to figure out what it really means. That it might be safe in one context and not in another, and it's really difficult to determine what the context actually is. Um, then historically, browsers have done historic things to try to make uh, sense out of malformed content, uh, mostly to try to win market share when at a time when most webmasters were hopelessly incompetent. And so uh, that stuff is still in browsers. And in fact, much of what HTML5 was was codifying those bad practices, which are used mainly by attackers. Um, then to make all of that worse, on the server side, uh, we see a lot of template-based web frameworks, which are optimized for XSS injection. It turns out all of those frameworks will allow you to encode things properly but they will, every one of them, make it easier to do it wrong by default. And that's how it's usually done. The JavaScript global object gives every scrap of script the same powerful capabilities. So um, again, the confusion, it thinks all the script was, is representing the same server, even if they came from different things. But then again, as bad as it is at security, the browser is a vast improvement over everything else. That's how bad everything else is. And it, it, it fundamentally comes down to confusion of interests. The browser distinguishes between the interests of the user and the interests of the site, which is good, but it didn't go far enough. It didn't anticipate that there could be other interests as well, and that's where XSS comes from. So within a page, the interests get confused. So an ad or a widget or an AJAX library gets the same rights as your scripts, and there's no way you can know that they're not going to abuse them. JavaScript as a language got close to getting it right. And it is repairable. And we've seen uh, some interesting work, particularly the uh, secure ECMAScript work being done at Google, uh, give us reason to be optimistic that JavaScript can be repaired. The DOM, though, is another story. So HTML grants uh, power to the confusers. It is itself easily confused. Um, it is forgiving because of those incompetent webmasters. 
Um, the DOM's API, the, the DOM, is also insecure and I think hopeless to repair. Um, you know, even if you're as hopeful as Daniel, uh, this stuff is not going to get fixed in a hurry in any case. Um, so it's up to web developers to try to create secure applications on an insecure platform. But there's hope in principles. Um, any unit of software should be given just the capabilities it needs to do its work and no more. Uh, this is called the principle of least authority. And it's something that we can and should be applying to uh, the web and to everything else. I think this is our, our best hope for creating secure systems. It's derived from the actor model, um, which we've talked about before. Um, um, so uh, the actor model first appeared in 1973 as a response to uh, the original small talk. Uh, the actor model um, we've talked about inspired uh, the scheme programming language, which inspired the, the functions in JavaScript. That's good stuff. The actor model um, also applies to security in a really interesting way. So an actor is a computational entity. It could be an object or it could be a system. It, it, the model doesn't actually say how big an actor is. An actor can send a message to another actor only if it knows its address. Two actors who don't know each other's addresses cannot communicate. And it turns out uh, that's, that's a security mechanism it, that has virtually no enforcement cost and no management cost. An actor can create a new actor, and an actor can create and can receive messages. Web workers are sort of actors. Web services generally aren't um, because they don't uh, do all of these, although there is a web service framework that does. So uh, uh, the, the Waterkin system applies the actor model to web services in a, in a rather brilliant way. Um, so I highly recommend that we take a look at Waterkin. But that's for another time. Um, so. Um, depending on what level you're looking at, um, a capability could be the address of an actor. Um, at, in, in an in-memory system, a reference is an address, and so we can use uh, references within an object-oriented system um, to implement a capability system. We call this object capabilities. So let me walk you through this. Um, here we've got an object A. Object A has some state and behavior. We have um, object A has a reference or pointer to uh, object B that allows um, A to send messages or to call methods on object B because it has such a reference. If it didn't have such a reference, it couldn't. Um, object B provides an interface that constrains access to its own state. So a doesn't get access to the stuff inside, just gets to talk to the object's API. Um, here we've got three objects, A, B, and C. Uh, B does not have a reference to C, but A would like it to. And so A will send a message to B. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of it. So an object capability system is produced by constraining the ways that references are obtained. A reference can be obtained, or cannot. A reference cannot be obtained simply by knowing the name of a global variable or a public class. You have to be, uh, get it by either creation, construction, or introduction. Um, let's see. So creation means that um, if a function creates an object, it gets the right to communicate with that object. I mean, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. So that has to work. Then B, by construction, an object may be endowed by its constructor with references to certain things. These are things that it may be inheriting. Then the interesting one is by introduction. Um, so here we've got um, object A, which has references to B and C. And A decides that it wants um, B to be able to communicate with C. So it can do an introduction. So it will send a message to B containing a reference to C. And when that message is delivered, B now has acquired the capability to communicate with C. This is a really simple mechanism, uh, but it's really easy to manage. It's really easy to construct with. And you can build amazingly sophisticated systems with it. If references can only be obtained by creation, construction, or introduction, then you may have a safe system. 
And if, um, you know, if those aren't true, then you certainly don't. Um, so some things you have to watch out for in designing a, a, a capability system are irrigation, corruption, confusion, and collusion. So irrigation means to take or to claim for oneself without right. So this would include things like global variables or um, uh, public static variables in, in Java, for example, or standard libraries that grant powerful capabilities to things like file systems or networks or operating systems or, or you know, all of that to anybody who asks. Uh, any language which does address generation, like C++, for example, can't be a capability system. Or any system with known URLs where simply knowing the URL gets you some powerful stuff um, that doesn't work either. Although URLs containing a large amount of, of apparently random stuff potentially are capabilities. Then corruption. It should not be possible to tamper with or circumvent the system or other objects. Uh, confusion. It should not be, it should be possible to create objects that are not subject to confusion. A, confusion. a confused object could be tricked into misusing its capabilities. And finally, collusion. It must not be possible for two objects to communicate until they are introduced. Um, if two independent objects can collude, then they might be able to pool their capabilities to cause harm. You, know, you might give one object matches and another one gasoline with the expectation that they can never get together. And, and um, so one of the things we use to manage capabilities is rights attenuation. So some capabilities are just too dangerous to give to guest code. We can instead give those capabilities to intermediate objects that will constrain the power. For example, an intermediate object for a file system might limit access to a particular device or directory, or to limit the size of files, or the number of files, or the longevity of files, or the types of files. Uh, ultimately, every object should be given exactly the capabilities it needs to do its work and no more. So if capability should be granted on a need-to-do basis, similar to the way we give information on a need-to-know basis. And if we do this, then if an object is compromised, all of the attacker could possibly hope to get is the capabilities that that object had. And if they were limited enough, the attack will have failed. Whereas in most systems, if you can confuse any object, that gives you access to all of the application's capabilities. Um, intermediate objects or facets um, can be lightweight mechanisms for, for doing attenuation. And class-free languages, especially uh, functional languages like JavaScript, can be extremely effective because the cost of a, a lightweight object or, or function is so low. So um, here we've got um, a, a guest object, and we want it to be able to communicate with a powerful object, but we want to limit it. So we have it talk to this facet instead, and the facet can filter the messages that go through and constrain them and, and limit its access. Uh, one criticism of capability systems is that references are not revocable. Once I introduce an object to another object, I can't then ask it to forget that I did that. Or, or I, I can ask it, but I can't rely on it, it, it doing that. Um, but there are other mechanisms which can accomplish the same thing. So here, um, the guest will make a request of an agency for uh, access to a powerful object. The agency does not give it a reference to the powerful object. Instead, it introduces it to a facet. And the facet can pass through or, or filter as before. Um, and then when the agency decides that um, it wants to revoke, it sends a message to the facet saying, forget how, what you do. Just uh, null out all of your, your references. It now becomes completely inert. The guest still has access to the facet, but the facet is useless, at least for the purpose of reaching the powerful object. And so we have effectively done the revocation. I, I'm sorry, in what? Yeah. Yeah, uh, capabilities are starting to get into things. There's some, uh, OAuth 2, for example, is starting to be like a capability system. It's not quite there, but it's getting closer. So, yeah, this, is, this stuff is moving on. And the way we got here is people have tried literally everything else. 
Um, there has been a community that's been advocating capabilities for a long time, and they were told, no, we got Ackles, we got these other things, they'll do it. Turns out they don't. And so having tried everything else, we're now reluctantly doing capabilities, and they seem to be holding up. A facet can mark requests so that a powerful object can know where they came from. So one criticism of, of capabilities is that we don't get accountability, but it turns out we can if, if we want it. Um, so facets are very expressive. They're easy to construct. They're lightweight. They allow us to do attenuation or rights reduction. They give us revocation, notification, and delegation. It turns out the best object-oriented patterns are capability patterns. So very often when you're doing object-oriented programming, you have a choice. I could factor things to work this way or I could do it that way. And it's hard to, to know which one is right. If you look at it in terms of capabilities, you know, which is delivering the least amount of information or the least amount of capability, that tends to be the right one. Um, so if you're doing good object-oriented programming, you're already doing good capability programming. Uh, so attenuation is your friend. Uh, facets can reduce the power of dangerous objects. Uh, most code should not be given access to inner HTML or document.write. Um, instead of trying to guess if a piece of code can do something bad, we give it safe capabilities instead, and then it doesn't matter. So if I know some code is coming from Satan, if Satan bought an ad on my site, I want to make sure that his stuff is going through a system which will ensure that he gets only the capabilities to display his ad and nothing else. Um, and so I, I said that. Um, so for more on this stuff, there's a brilliant talk by Mark Stiegler um, that you can get on the YouTube called The Lazy Programmer's Guide to Secure Computing. Highly recommend it. Um, so how are we doing on time? Okay, we can do this. So this is a little application. Uh, Mark Miller designed this example. Um, we're in ECMAScript 3 now. This is a, a little JavaScript program. And um, it's doing stuff in a in a closure so that um, this function is going to produce an object with three methods in it. Um, and the intention is that this object will protect access to an array. So the theory is we can give this object to Satan and Satan cannot get to that array. And, and this appears to do that, except it actually doesn't. Um, it is possible for an attacker to get access to array. Um, so, I'm sorry? Override the table. Well, you can't, because table, well, overriding the table, you'll lose everything. So you don't get access to this array. But then you populate whatever you want to do there. Right, but you still don't have access to that array. We're trying to keep this array out of Satan's evil clutches. So, no, no, brute force doesn't work. Uh, so th that's one thing good about JavaScript. So that level of irrigation will not work. Um, also, we don't have ad address generation, so you, you can't be going to deep memory. No, well, you get through all the elements of the array. You have a copy of the array, then you override. Mm -hmm. you but you don't get access to the array. All you get access to are those three methods. That's right, you push the get. Okay, so, um, so I, I can tamper with the push, okay? So um, I, I, repl I replace, um, end up using store to replace the push method that gets called by append. So then when I call the append, it returns the table. The reason this works is because JavaScript is confused about what arrays are or we're confused about what arrays are. JavaScript knows what they are, but it, it's wrong. Um, we, we think an array is a linear sequence of memory with slots. It's an object pretty much like any other object, except it's got a magic length property, and a magic length property provides us no security here. So um, we would think that um, store will always take an integer there. And in fact, we, we actually deceived ourselves by putting a type annotation in the variable name, right? We think i is going to be an integer. Turns out it can be a string. Um, and things like push should have been an operator. But there's some places where JavaScript improperly took the, you know, everything as an object 
thing and made it a method instead, which leads to this vulnerability. Um, so uh, JavaScript is unfortunately in its current state a much more difficult language to program securely in than it should be. And so one of the goals of the Secure ECMAScript project is to try to fix that, to repair the language so that these sorts of vulnerabilities don't occur. So a big source of security vulnerabilities is confusion. Uh, this is also where bugs come from. Anytime a program can do something other than what it actually does, that's an opportunity for things to go wrong. And sometimes it's functional, sometimes it's um, security. So confusion aids the enemy. Bugs are a manifestation of confusion. And we can't tolerate confusion in our code. We can't tolerate bugs in our code. Um, with great complexity comes great confusion. And so the best advice is always try to keep it simple, try to keep it clean. As systems get unwieldy and overly complicated, the likelihood that they're also becoming insecure also increases. So as much as possible, you want to always be refactoring, simplifying, getting it down, 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 managing the complexity. You want to be coding well. Good code is ultimately cheaper to produce than bad code. And so you should always write good code because it just, it's cheaper in the long run. Good code is easier to reason about. Um, code that is difficult to reason about is more likely to be problematic. Um, so strict conformance to good style rules is not just good in terms of productivity, it's also good in terms of security. And security is everybody's job. And if you're writing in JavaScript, you're using JSLint. Uh, never trust a machine that is not under your absolute control. And, I, and the ones that are under my control, I, I don't really trust those either. Um, so don't get more intimate between machines than sharing JSON payloads. Uh, otherwise, bad things are likely to happen. And always never trust your browser. It cannot and will not protect your interests. Um, properly filter and validate all input, everything that you get from the browser. Yeah? With the JSON payload, I can still scan function and get back to the same code. No, uh, JSON does. If you're properly encoding JSON, you can't send functions. If you're properly encoding JSON, you can't send functions. So um, you should be using JSON.parse. You should never use eval. You should never use JSONP. Look, don't do those. I use JSON.parse. It's built into the browsers. JSON2.js is free for the browsers that don't do ES5. Um, that's just common sense. Um, so context is everything. Everything's got to be encoded for the correct context. Otherwise, the attacker can insert code. Um, yeah, so templating and temp temporary insanity. That, there was a joke there, but um, it's not funny enough. So here's an example of, of what you can do with, with um, code insertion. This is the simplest uh, attack that I, I've been able to find. And most web servers will be vulnerable by default. So um, you, you get the user to put in a password like uh, your site slash script dot 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 close script. And the server will return a 404 page which says, I couldn't find this file, and then includes a script. Now in, in HTML position, this is meaningful and it's executable. So you know the attacker now has your cookies. The attacker now has a connection to your your server. It now has the phishing chrome set to its color. You're, you've lost, right? Um, well, there's still lots of other stuff you can get. If, you, if you're using super cookies. You, you get those. If, if you're putting stuff in your local storage, you've given away that. I mean, it, it, it's all gone. Um, and so most will do this by default. Um, this was easy. This required no effort. All you have to do is come up with a bit.ly URL that'll send the user to your site with that, and boom, you're, you're compromised. Um, so. In a lot of these systems, the way you build text is by concatenation. And it turns out it's really easy to cause bad things to happen by concatenating, so you don't want to do it. 
you want to use proper encoders instead. So you want to use thing instead of concatenating together a JSON string, you want to use JSON.stringify, you know, passing it material, which will it'll then turn into a valid um, text. One source of insecurity I'm happy to report is rarely reported anymore. Um, it used to be if you're trying to convince someone to um, invest in making the system secure, they would ask about the intentions of the attacker. Why would anyone do that? We know that now. Um, so that, this is not something you hear anymore. They'll do it because you let them. That, that's enough. They'll do it because they can make money on you. They'll do it just because they're mean and nasty. They'll do it for whatever reason. It doesn't matter why they would do it. We have to prevent them from doing it anyway. Um, so this is a, a few more. Uh, inconvenience is not security. You hear people all this time saying, well, we can't stop them, but we can sure as heck slow them down. We're going to put speed bumps on the information superhighway. And that turns out not to work. It, it just wastes your time. It, it, if it's not effective, it's ineffective, so don't do that. Identity is not security. Now, knowing that someone is Satan doesn't make it safe to have them connect. Um, data tainting ain't security. Um, and intrusion detection is not security. I've seen a lot of uh, operators who are so frustrated with getting attacked all the time that they've, they've given up all hope of preventing the attacks. They just want to know when it happens. So that, that's, that's useless. Um, perhaps the biggest source of, of insecurity is mismanagement. Um, when you've got management saying, I don't care what it takes, we're going to make this milestone, we're going to make this date, we're going to make this deliverable, do whatever it takes to have that happen, and don't worry about security. We'll go back and we'll fix it later. And it turns out uh, we don't. Uh, so that's the end. Uh, that's Volapuk for thank you and good night.